All right, everyone, we're now on to tier four, halfway into this iceberg chart. Again, for anyone new, this iceberg series explores the weird theories and speculations out there about paleontology, which is the study of ancient life. Also, I should have done this to tier one, but shout out to the creator of this iceberg, Sustained Disgust. I'll link the original post in the description if anyone wants to check it out. Anyways, let's get into the first entry now. Underground Ocean Keplerian Tidal Theory. The concept of an underground ocean, often linked to the Keplerian tidal theory, is mostly like a planetary science theory but also has some paleo aspects to it. In an 1858 article named The Tides, it said that Johannes Kepler, a German astronomer who you all might know from his laws on planetary motion, once speculated that the tides on Earth were influenced by its respirations, as if the planet were a living animal. He even went as far as to say that humans were like insects feeding on the Earth's back. One of the adding on theories he entertained was that the tides were caused by the ocean's water circulating in and out through a large hole at each pole, which communicated from a subterranean passage to the earth. This theory suggested the existence of an underground ocean. Kepler proposed that the existence of this underground ocean could account for the finding of fossil shells in places far from any sea, such as the summits of mountains, which is explained in Martin Rudwick's book, The Meaning of Fossils. He proposed the theory that shellfish from one area of the ocean may have been carried by the subsurface tidal systems, elevated into streams that flowed through the mountains, and then deposited on the mountainside. In the end though, Kepler rejected the subsurface ocean explanation of Earth's tides, and instead correctly suggested that the moon's gravitational influence was the source of the tides. Waukesha's Butterfly Creature The Waukesha Butterfly Creature is a pretty mysterious organism from the Cambrian period, a time known for its rapid diversification of life and often referred to as the Cambrian Explosion. This creature, which isn't even properly named yet, is an arthropod that lived in an aquatic environment millions of years before the first true butterfly. Even though it's not considered a butterfly since those came after 240 million years, its unique appearance greatly resembles a butterfly. This is because of its bivalve-like shell and a pair of wings extending from its body. Despite the high frequency of fossil remains found in the Waukesha Lager State Fossil Site in Wisconsin, the creature's classification is still a mystery making it one of the most incomprehensible of the Cambrian fauna. Some scientists have suggested it might be related to crustaceans, but that's still a topic of debate out there. Sacred Theory of Earth Burnett Thomas Burnett was an English clergyman and geological theorist who is best known for his work Sacred Theory of the Earth, first published in Latin in 1681 and later translated into English. In the speculative cosmogony, Burnett proposed a hollow earth with most of its water inside until Noah's flood, at which point mountains and oceans appeared. He suggested that Earth was originally a perfect sphere and that a series of divine catastrophes including flooding and earthquakes led to its current uneven and mountainous state that we see now. Burnett's theory was an attempt to reconcile the mechanical explanation of the Earth's formation as proposed by René Descartes with the biblical account of creation in Genesis. Descartes has suggested that the Earth was once a star that crusted over and Burnett expanded on this idea by explaining how natural processes could align with the scripture such as the timing of the earth cracking open to release the waters for Noah's flood. Burnett's work was controversial though because he used natural causes to explain biblical events traditionally conceived as miracles, which attracted a lot of negative attention at the time. Despite this, his theory was influential and became a standard against which many geological theories were measured for over a century, as writers felt compelled to adjust their scientific explanations with the biblical creation story. Burnett's theory, while not scientifically accurate by modern standards, still remains an important step in the history of geological thought though, and the attempt to understand the Earth's past. Ancient Armored Whales The idea of armored whales, specifically the prehistoric prairie whales known as Zuglodon or Basilosaurus, was based on an interpretation of basilosaurid vertebrae by Dames and Abel. They proposed that these ancient whales were covered in armor plates similar to the giant oceanic armadillo. This theory was further supported by embryological discoveries by Richard Leidecker, a well-known British paleontologist. The supposed armor plates were found in association with Zuglodot remains, linked to the belief that these whales had a dorsal bony dermal armor. This theory sparked debates about why ancient whales had been covered in armor and was incorporated into many discussions about Basilosaurus. However, these armor fossils were later debunked by Frederick A. Lucas in 1902, who identified them as misidentified leatherback turtle remains. Despite this, references to the armored stage in whale evolution still persisted up to the 1950s. Also, Bernard Hevlumens, often referred to as the father of cryptozoology, suggested that a relic armor-plated Zuglodon could have been the identity of many finned sea serpent sightings. Even though this theory was later disproved, the idea of these whales having armor was still pretty significant in the early description and understanding, giving way to the things we know now. 
M. fragilimus rumors. The story of Amphocalias fragilimus is a pretty controversial chapter in paleontology. Edward Drinker Culp, a prominent paleontologist, described this dinosaur species based on the discovery of a single enormous vertebra that stood over a meter tall. According to Culp's description, this vertebra suggested the existence of an exceptionally large sauropod, potentially the biggest one ever known. However, the fossil of Amphocalias fragilimus, described as extremely fragile, has since been lost or misplaced. This loss of the fossil has caused some skepticism and debate about the existence and size of the dinosaur. Many researchers question whether the species even exists or not, or if Cope may have exaggerated its size based on limited evidence. The controversy surrounding Amphicolias fragilimus mostly comes from the lack of fossil evidence, though beyond Cope's initial description and a single drawing. The drawing has been scrutinized extensively by paleontologists, with various interpretations and analysis arguing both for and against the dinosaur's massive size. Kenneth Carpenter, among others, has advocated for the accuracy of Cope's original dimensions, supporting the idea that the sauropod could have been one of the largest ever known based on Cope's descriptions. Penin Ghost Pterodactyl The legend of the Penin's Ghost Pterodactyl came from reported sightings of a large, pterosaurus-like creature in the Penin's Hills region of West Yorkshire in 1982. Witnesses claimed to have seen a mysterious, ghostly presence resembling a giant pterodactyl flying in the area. According to the accounts, the creature was described as wispy and translucent, giving an ethereal or ghost-like appearance. One of the witnesses, Mike Priestley, managed to capture a photograph of the alleged creature. However, as is pretty common with sightings of cryptids or unusual phenomena, the photograph turned out blurry and inconclusive. When this got to the public, some people were fascinated by the idea of a prehistoric creature seemingly appearing as a ghost in the modern world. To be honest, I personally would be terrified of the thought. I remember seeing size comparisons of pterodactyls with humans, and it's pretty terrifying to say the least. However, the lack of concrete evidence, along with the blurry photograph and the nature of the reports, led most scientists and experts to regard the settings as unsubstantiated and likely a result of misidentification, hoaxes, or optical illusions. Like other cryptid tales out there, it's still pretty much a mystery. Bad eyesight killed dinosaurs, Croft. The hypothesis proposed by ophthalmologist L. R. Croft in 1982 regarding the end Cretaceous extinction event links it to poor eyesight in dinosaurs. Croft suggested that global warming led to widespread cataracts in dinosaurs, ultimately resulting in their extinction. He theorized that many dinosaurs, including species like Ceratopsians, attempted to protect their eyes from the intense sunlight by developing horns and crests. However, these adaptions were ineffective in shielding their eyes from the damaging effects of the sun, leading to vision impairment. Croft imagined a scenario where dinosaurs gradually became blind as they matured, with the majority losing their vision before reaching sexual maturity. This idea though is highly speculative and hasn't really gained traction within the scientific community. There's pretty limited evidence supporting the idea that dinosaurs suffered from widespread cataracts due to global warming. Additionally, the notion that most dinosaurs were rendered blind before even reaching maturity also lacks empirical data or fossil evidence. Dimetrodon as human ancestor Dimetrodon, the famous sailback creature from the Permian period, is commonly misunderstood as a direct ancestor of dinosaurs, or even humans, in popular culture. The reality is though, Dimetrodon is classified as a synapsid, belonging to a group of animals known as mammal-like reptiles. These creatures aren't dinosaurs, but rather are part of a separate lineage called synapsids. Synapsids are pretty important since they eventually gave rise to therapsids, a subgroup within which modern mammals evolved. Although Dimetrodon is a distinct relative within the synapsid lineage, and shares an ancestor with mammals, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a direct ancestor of modern humans or even dinosaurs. Gymetrodon lived long before dinosaurs and human appeared on Earth. It represents a branch in the evolutionary tree that eventually led to mammals, including humans, but it's more like a distinct cousin rather than direct ancestor. A lot of the traction of his theory basically comes from some popular science outlets or media representations. Glacial Cosmogony This entry is about the concept of an ice wall surrounding the Earth and is often associated with various theories and fringe beliefs, including some interpretations in the Flat Earth community and the concept of an ice ball Earth. Flat Earth supporters propose a model where they believe the Earth is not a sphere but a flat, disc-shaped plane and they argue that an ice wall or a massive wall of ice encircles the entire disc, preventing people from falling off the edge of the Earth. On the flip side though, the ice ball Earth hypothesis in scientific terms proposes extreme ice ages in Earth's history suggesting periods where the planet was almost entirely or largely covered in ice, like in the Ice Age movies. This idea is based on geological and paleoclimatological evidence, whereas the other is still more of a theory and a fringe belief. Abyss of Time Hutton James Hutton, an influential Scottish geologist from the 18th century, made significant contributions to our understanding of Earth's history 
and the concept of deep geological time. His observations, particularly at Sicker Point Cliffs in Scotland, led to a great shift in our scientific understanding. At Sicker Point, Hutton noticed rock formations arranged in layers at steep angles. He recognized that these rock layers had been deposited horizontally, then subsequently tilted and eroded, indicating long periods of time and gradual slow geological processes. Hutton realized that the time required for these geological processes to occur must have been far greater than the few thousand years suggested by the biblical accounts of Earth history, which were commonly accepted at the time. Hun's insights challenged the prevailing idea of a young Earth, with a relatively short history and a series of catastrophic events shaping its geological features. Instead, he proposed the principle of uniformitarianism. This principle suggests that Earth's geological processes occur slowly and consistently over vast spans of time. Hun's concept of deep time, often described as a dizzying abyss of time, introduced the idea of an Earth with a super long history, potentially millions or even billions of years old. Also, Hun's ideas challenged the notion that Earth's history had to include constant human presence or creations linked to humans. He proposed the view of an Earth that existed independent of humans operating under its own natural laws and processes for vast spans of time before human existence. These concepts really changed our scientific perspective on Earth's ancient history like we know now. Heterogenesis Colliker Colliker's concept of heterogenesis was a theory proposed within the framework of saltationism, a departure from Charles Darwin's progressive view of evolution through natural selection. Heterogenesis suggested a mechanism of evolution where new species emerged rapidly from the birth of noticeably distinct individuals, termed heterogenic. Unlike Darwin's theory of evolution, which talks about gradual changes over time due to external environmental pressures and natural selection, heterogenesis proposed that the process of species transformation occurs internally within organisms. Basically, in this theory, the emergence of a new species was believed to be triggered by the sudden appearance or birth of an individual that was completely different from its parent species. This new individual was considered to be the fundamental departure or leap from its ancestor, leading to the rapid emergence of a new species. The concept of heterogenesis is pretty similar to saltationism, which suggests that evolution occurs through abrupt, significant changes or saltations, rather than gradual modifications. Both these theories propose mechanisms that involve sudden and substantial shifts in traits, leading to the formation of new species in a relatively short period. Venomous Dinosaurs In 2009, Empu Gong proposed a hypothesis suggesting that Sananothosaurus, a small theropod dinosaur, might have possessed grooved elongated fangs suggesting a venomous bite. This hypothesis speculated that Sinornithosaurus could have potentially used venom to immobilize or stun its prey. The basis for this hypothesis primarily stemmed from the examination of the skull and teeth of Sinornithosaurus, particularly the presence of long, grooved fangs resembling those found in some venomous snakes. However, later analysis and further studies, including those conducted by Empu Gong himself, raised doubts about the initial idea of venomous dinosaurs, specifically Sinornithosaurus. Additional research and re-evaluation of the anatomical features observed in these dinosaurs provide alternative explanations for the structures interpreted as venomous adaptions. The grooved elongated fangs, initially thought to be for delivering venom, might have had other purposes. Some researchers now propose that these teeth could have been used for grasping and holding onto prey, rather than delivering venom. Others suggest that grooves in the teeth might have served a different function, such as channeling blood or sensory adaptions, rather than venom delivery. It's a pretty cool concept thinking that dinosaurs, who were already so powerful, were equipped with venom, but it's still just a hypothesis. Evolutionary Polygenism The polygenist theory, prevalent before and after Charles Darwin's time, proposed multiple origins for different human races, often arguing that different races emerged from separate ancestors or creation events. The theory contradicted Darwin's monogenesis idea, which posited a single common ancestor for all humans. Proponents of polygenism, including Georges Carvier and Louis Agassiz, used their own interpretations of science to argue that various human races were fundamentally different and had separate origins. They sometimes even questioned the humanity of non-white races, reflecting prevailing racist beliefs of their era. Following Darwin's publication of evolutionary theory, some individuals basically misused or misinterpreted Darwin's ideas to basically reinforce their pre-existing racist beliefs. Scientists like Henry Fairford Osborne, Ernest Hackle, and Carlton Kuhn attempted to support the polygenist view by suggesting that human races were too distinct to have descended from a common ancestor. They proposed that different human groups evolved from different primate ancestors, a perspective inconsistent with growing evidence supporting a shared human ancestry. These viewpoints were flawed and ran counter to accumulating evidence in fields such as anthropology, genetics, and paleontology, which consistently supported the unity of humanity. 
attempts to reconcile this flawed theory led some researchers into some pretty dubious paths. One such example was Carlton Kuhn's private belief in the existence of Bigfoot to explain the origins of native North Americans, which lacked scientific basis. Shaver's Rock Boots Richard Sharpe Shaver was an author known for his unconventional and highly imaginative stories published in Amazing Stories magazine during the mid 20th century. He gained notoriety for the Shaver Mystery, a series of stories that suggested to be true accounts of an underground world inhabited by abandoned Lemurian ruins, devolved Atlanteans, and evil robots that abducted and tortured humans from the surface. According to Shaver, he received telepathic communication from an underground Lemurian which revealed the existence of this hidden realm and its inhabitants. These stories ended up interesting a bunch of readers with their fantastical elements and mysterious narratives. Later in his career, Shaver delved into what he termed rock boots, in which he interpreted various natural mineral formations, which are geofacts, as containing images and text related to his Atlantean beliefs. He claimed to discern faces and symbols within rocks and stones, which he interpreted as evidence of this ancient Atlantean civilization. Despite the unconventional nature of his work, Shaver's rock images have gained some attention in the realm of outsider art or folk art due to their intriguing and sometimes haunting visual qualities. Eggshell Pathology Killed Dinosaurs The idea proposed by H.K. Urban in 1979 suggesting that dinosaur extinction was caused by eggshell pathology at the KT, which is the cretaceous paleogene boundary, is an intriguing but controversial theory in the study of dinosaur extinction. Urban identified a sequence of dinosaurs from the KT boundary that exhibited various pathologies. Some eggs displayed near solidified characteristics, while others had abnormally thin shells. Based on these observations, Urban hypothesized that these eggshell pathologies were indicative of a widespread environmental changes that led to the extinction of dinosaurs. The theory proposed by Urban suggests that changes in the environment possibly relate to factors like climate change, changes in vegetation, or alterations in atmospheric conditions could have negatively affected the quality of the eggshells. These weakened or abnormal eggshells might have led to reduced hatchability rates and increased vulnerability of dinosaur embryos, ultimately contributing to their extinction. However, the hypothesis is not widely accepted within the scientific community as the primary cause of dinosaur extinction. Jefferson's Mammoth Thomas Jefferson had a deep interest in natural history, including a fascination with mammoths. In 1787, he wrote a detailed report disputing the theories of French naturalist Buffon, who suggested that American species were inferior to those in Europe. Jefferson used the discovery of mammoth fossils in America to counter Buffon's claims, highlighting the size and significance of the American mammoth as evidence of the continent's unique and impressive natural history. Jefferson's fascination with mammoths extended to his beliefs about their current existence. He was skeptical about the concept of extinction and entertained the idea that mammoths might actually still roam the unexplored regions of the Americas. Some accounts suggest that Jefferson considered the thought of mammoths as carnivorous creatures capable of bounding across the land in great leaps, influenced by the fringe interpretation of the evangelical George Turner. This belief, suggesting a surviving population of mammoths, was not uncommon during Jefferson's time, as there was limited scientific understanding of extinction. Many naturalists and thinkers of that era speculated about the possibility of living remnants of ancient species existing in remote, unexplored regions. Frozen Dinosaur Claims Rumors and tales of frozen dinosaurs preserved in ice, similar to the famous discoveries of frozen mammoth carcasses in Siberia, have been part of cryptozoological lore and speculative stories within pop culture. These accounts often center on the idea of discovering intact dinosaur remains in icy environments. One notable case in cryptozoological literature is the story of the Glacier Island Carcass, reportedly describing the discovery of a giant lizard-like reptile that thawed in Alaska in 1930. The story circulated in speculative narratives, suggesting that the creature was a relic of the dinosaur age preserved in ice. While the discovery of well-preserved mammoth remains in frozen environments like Serbia has indeed occurred and contributed to our understanding of prehistoric life, the likelihood of finding intact dinosaur remains preserved in ice is pretty low. This is primarily because dinosaurs lived during the Mesozoic era, tens of millions of years ago and the remains are typically found as fossilized bones or traces rather than as frozen specimens. The geological time gap between dinosaurs and the more recent frozen environments where mammoth carcasses have been discovered makes the existence of frozen, intact dinosaur specimens highly improbable. But who knows, maybe in the future, a discovery might change it all. Haley's Inner Earths Edmund Haley, a prominent 17th century scholar, proposed a unique theory about the Earth's structure, suggesting that it was not only hollow but also filled with a bunch of smaller, concentric spheres similar to a Russian doll. He based his theory on his observations of periodic magnetic pole shifts. 
According to Haley, these inner hollow globes rotate independently of each other, producing what he termed as the deep music of the rolling world, a seismic music that he claimed to have detected and transcribed in his manuscript on the subject. Despite the initial interest in this theory, later scientific discoveries and advancements led to the discrediting of Haley's proposal. The concept of a hollow earth, including Haley's ideas, has since become a common element in fiction and folklore. Haley's theories, while ultimately disproven, remains an intriguing part of the history of scientific thought and the ongoing human quest to understand the mysteries of the natural world. Astropaleontology Astropaleontology is the hypothetical study of fossils of extraterrestrial organisms, a term first coined by John Amitage. This field is part of the broader discipline of astrobiology, which focuses on the study of the origins, early evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe. The primary goal of astropaleobiology, a related field, is to locate and interpret evidence of former life, requiring a multidisciplinary approach that includes scientific efforts from various fields. While the concept of astropaleontology sounds pretty interesting, as of now, there's no confirmed evidence of extraterrestrial life, and the study of fossils of extraterrestrial organisms remains speculative. Despite this, the field has attracted attention and has since been the subject of discussions and research, particularly in the context of astrobiological applications. Ray Stanford's Occult Links Ray Stanford was an American amateur paleontologist, known for his significant contributions to paleontology and his remarkable fossil discoveries. He gained attention for his impressive abilities in finding fossils and gathering a vast private collection. However, his views and practices often made him a controversial figure within the scientific community. Stanford was known for being critical of what he perceived as scientific gatekeeping and was sometimes hesitant to share detailed information about his discoveries with the wider scientific community. This reluctance to disclose his findings led to some skepticism and controversy surrounding his work within the field of paleontology. Additionally, Stanford held unconventional beliefs in the field of UFOlogy, the study of unidentified flying objects, and claimed to have had encounters with extraterrestrial beings. He asserted that these encounters had granted him psychic abilities including the purported ability to find fossils. Stanford attributed his success in finding fossils to these alleged telepathic communications with extraterrestrial entities, rather than simply relying on traditional paleontological methods. Permanent Darkness in Dinosaur Times Thomas Hawkins was an English fossil collector and dealer, particularly known for his work with ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. He published several texts between the 1830s and 1850s, with his two best-known works being Memoirs of Ichthyosauri and Plesiosauri and the Book of the Great Sea Dragons. Hawkins' writings were characterized by a hyper-Miltonic style, which was very prosaic and dramatic. One of the more unusual and persistent claims across Hawkins' work was the idea that ichthyosaurs and pterodactyls lived in complete darkness. He speculated that the sun's light, if it existed at the time, could not penetrate the atmospheric layers of smog, which maintained a permanently nocturnal surface on Earth. If anyone wants to read more about Hawkins' work, Ralph O'Connor's book, The Earth on Show, Fossils and the Poetics of Popular Science, 1802-1856, is a good one out there that delves into it. This book explores the portrayal of the geological past to the public and examines how new ideas about deep time and Earth's history were communicated during the early Victorian era. Spiral Arm Causes Cyclic Mass Extinctions This entry is about the idea that the Sun's galactic spiral arm led to cyclic mass extinction events on Earth. This hypothesis suggests a connection between the Earth's position within the Milky Way galaxy's spiral arms and major extinction events such as the Permian-Triassic extinction which occurred around 252 million years ago. Proponents of this theory suggest that as the solar system moves through the Milky Way spiral arms, it encounters varying levels of cosmic radiation, different gravitational forces, or altered distributions of interstellar matter. These encounters, as theorized, could potentially trigger disturbances in the Earth's environment and contribute to catastrophic events linked to mass extinctions. The concept proposes that during specific periods when the solar system is positioned further, from the galactic habitability zone, there could be increased risk of disruptions to Earth's systems, including climate change, increased cosmic radiation exposure, or other cosmic influences that might negatively impact life on Earth. The geological record does show evidence of major extinction events throughout Earth's history, but attributing these events slowly to the Sun's position within the Milky Way spiral arms is challenging to confirm. Pterosaurs could not walk. This theory, proposed by C.D. Bramwell and G.R. Whitfield in 1974, Suggests that pterosaurs were incapable of supporting their body weight on the ground and instead became airborne by sliding off cliffs on their stomachs. Their hypothesis was based on the anatomical structure of pterosaurs, specifically their limb proportions and wing structure. They proposed that due to their biomechanics and proportions of their limbs, pterosaurs might have faced difficulties in walking or taking off from the ground. 
According to his theory, instead of taking off from a standing position, pterosaurs might have used alternative methods such as launching themselves off cliffs or elevated surfaces. The idea was that they would rely on gravity and momentum, sliding down surfaces to become airborne, somewhat similar to the way penguins on land use their bodies to propel themselves forward. While it's true that pterosaurs had unique atomical features, the idea that they were entirely incapable of walking or taking off the ground isn't really accepted. Bird Stem Hemotherm The concept that birds and mammals share a common ancestor classified as stem hemotherm or stem ammonite is a minority of speculative view in evolutionary biology. Richard Owen, a prominent 19th century biologist and paleontologist, proposed a taxonomic category called hemothermia, which encompassed birds and animals, suggesting certain similarities between these groups. However, modern evolutionary biology and paleontology have since established that birds and mammals evolved along separate evolutionary paths from different reptilian ancestors. The idea of a shared ancestor between birds and mammals resurfaced though in the late 20th century, notably in the work of scientists like Sorian Lovthrop, Brian Gardiner, and Philip Janvier. These researchers proposed the concept of a stem amnionite that could have given rise to both birds and mammals in ancient evolutionary history. This hypothesis suggests the existence of a hypothetical ancestor group that preceded the diversions of birds and mammals within the larger context of vertebrate evolution. The stem amnionite was envisioned as a creature possessing certain characteristics or features common to both birds and mammals, which later evolved into the distinct lineages we recognize today. This illustration by Philippe Janvier represents a speculative depiction of what such an ancient creature might have looked like based on evolutionary relationships. Fossils in European Devil Lore In European folklore and historical beliefs, there were instances where fossils and certain natural phenomena were associated with superstitions and beliefs involving the devil and witchcraft. Basically, fossilized creatures or unusual geological specimens sometimes played a role in cultural narratives and were linked to supernatural or demonic explanations. During the medieval and early modern periods, when scientific understanding was limited and superstitions were common, people often encountered fossils and unfamiliar geological formations. These discoveries were often misunderstood or interpreted within the framework of religious beliefs, folklore, and superstitions which were present at the time. In some cases, unusual fossils or ancient remains found on Earth were perceived as straight up monstrous or mysterious creatures of the past. There were beliefs that associated these remnants with devilish activities attributing their origins to mythical beings or demons. Such interpretations were sometimes incorporated into artistic depictions or stories, reflecting the prevailing cultural beliefs. An example is the Witch's Sabbath with Reconstructed Skeleton of Monster by Marco Antonio Raimondi, which is an artistic representation from the 16th century that reflects these beliefs. In this artwork, the illustration depicts a scene involving witches and a reconstructed or assembled skeleton of a monstrous creature. Gresliosaurus Madness Gresliosaurus, named after discoverer Amans Gresli, is a genus of Plateosaurus and Sauropodomorph dinosaur that lived during the Late Triassic period around 214 to 204 million years ago. The story of Gresliosaurus intertwines with the tragic tale of its discoverer, Gresli, a Swiss geologist and paleontologist who made significant contributions to the field of stratigraphy and paleoecology. He introduced the use of the term facies in geology and is considered one of the founders of modern stratigraphy and paleoecology. Gressley worked as an assistant to Louis Agassiz and made important geological observations in the Jura Mountain. Unfortunately though, Gressley suffered from mental health issues, and not only that, but Agassiz betrayed Gressley and stole some of his fossils, causing him to live a reclusive life before being institutionalized in an asylum in 1864. His friend and fellow paleontologist Oswald Heer visited him in this asylum and later wrote that Gressley and I'll quote what he said, was agonized by the thought that he had transformed into this Gressliosaurus. It's a sad story, but it goes to show the close relationship some scientists can have with their work, to the extent that it becomes a defining part of their identity. Tongue Hole Dolo Louis Dolo, a prominent Belgian paleontologist, suggested the presence of an opening in the lower jaw of Iguanodon, believing it to be an adaption for the tongue. He proposed that this opening might have accommodated a retractable, chameleon-like tongue the iguanodon could extend to reach vegetation. Dole's idea was an attempt to explain the feeding behavior of iguanodon based on the fossil evidence available at the time. Later scientific investigation and closer examination of iguanodon fossils revealed that the supposed opening dolo described in the lower jaw was actually an artifact or a crack in the fossil, rather than a natural anatomical feature of the dinosaur. 
Subsequent studies and re-examinations of Iguanodon demonstrated that Dola's interpretation regarding the tongue hole was incorrect. Despite the error in Dola's interpretation, his idea was incorporated into several textbooks and scientific illustrations before it was corrected. Tellyard Psychical Research, Griffin Fly Sciences An important paleoentomologist made significant contributions to the study of insect evolution in the early 20th century. He also had a lifelong interest in the occult, which intersected with his scientific pursuits. Tillyard's fascination with the flight mechanics of giant griffin flies led him to visit mediums in an attempt to observe the behavior of these prehistoric insects in spiritual form. Despite his interest in psychical research, Tillyard maintained a skeptical stance. When a medium predicted his death in a car crash within the next 10 years, Tillyard expressed skepticism about such psychic foresight. However, in a tragic turn of events, Tillyard was killed in a car accident in 1937. His involvement in psychical research and his scientific work reflect the complex and multifaceted nature of his interests and pursuits. Comsignatus Fins The claim that Comsignatus had flippers instead of grasping claws was initially described by Alan Bedar and Gerald Tommel in 1972. They proposed the existence of a new species, Comsignatus coralistris, with modified dolphin-like flippers envisioning it as a semi-aquatic animal. However, it was later determined that the fossil had been geologically distorted giving the appearance of flattened flippers when in reality it wasn't part of the actual animal. This discovery debunked the initial claim, but not before it had influenced some popular paleo art and media representations, creating some pretty cool depictions of what it looked like. Essentially, the idea of complex Ignathus having flippers was based on the misinterpretation of the fossil evidence, and it has since been corrected in scientific understanding. Who Lies Sleeping? Who Lies Sleeping is a book by Rex and Rita Stanford that goes into unconventional and speculative theories regarding pre-human civilizations and suggests the existence of a Saurian pre-human society. This book presents hypotheses suggesting that this ancient civilization was capable of advanced technology and might have met its end through nuclear warfare. Also, it suggests the existence of a secretive, dinosaur-like ruling elite or cable that might still have influence in modern times. The ideas explored in Who Lies Sleeping touch upon speculative concepts such as Saurian humanoid species often referred to as dinosauroids, which we introduced in Tier 1. Theories of ancient civilizations predating recorded human history and the potential connection between dinosaurs and certain concepts found in fringe theories like UFO lore and CU archaeology. These speculative concepts include notions like biorapturism, which are described as predatory creatures resembling dinosaurs, AV sapiens that suggest bird-like intelligent beings, and the idea that dinosaurs might be linked to alleged extraterrestrial or supernatural entities, such as greys or reptoids if anyone remembers that entry. I'll link this book down too if anyone wants to explore more of these conspiracy theories. Paleodictyon The Cambrian period, approximately 541 to 485 million years ago, is best known for the Cambrian explosion, a significant diversification of life forms. During this time, mysterious fossil traces resembling hexagonal honeycombs known as Paleodictyon have been found on the Cambrian seabed. These mysterious traces have sparked some scientific interest and debate. Seemingly recent examples of these traces have been discovered, which brought a suggestion that live specimens could still exist today. However, the creature associated with these traces also remains unknown, linked to two main theories. The first theory suggests that the traces are the direct bodily imprint of something like a polyop or sponge, while the second theory proposes that they are tunnel systems or burrows for an as of yet unknown animal. Additionally, the possibility that Paleodictyon is an abiotic formation known as a pseudofossil has also been suggested. So basically, the study of Pelodictyon and the ongoing debate surrounding its origins is still a mystery of the ancient world. Pedum caused by pre-human civilization The Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or Pedum, was a period occurring around 56 million years ago, known for its significant global warming event. During this period, there was a rapid release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, linked to substantial warming, ocean acidification, and changes in ecosystems. Some theories, such as Silurian hypothesis, suggest the possibility of ancient pre-human civilizations that might have existed in deep time, even during periods like the Petun. Proponents of this hypothesis have suggested that the sudden increase in fossil carbons during the Petun could potentially be attributed to carbon fuel use by an ancient civilization, similar to how humans use fossil fuels today. And remember how the thought experiment also says that finding direct evidence, such as technological artifacts, is unlikely due to the rarity of fossilization and the constant changes on Earth's surface. Therefore, the sudden increase in fossil carbon during the Petun could for sure indicate the use of carbon fuels by an ancient civilization, but right now there's no strong evidence to support this claim, so it remains an interesting theory out there.
Noogenesis. The concept of noogenesis is associated with Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a French philosopher, paleontologist, and Jesuit priest who proposed the idea of an evolutionary process that involves the emergence and development of consciousness in the universe. Teilhard de Chardin was the one that introduced the concept of the megapoint, which again represents the theoretical endpoint or culmination of cosmic evolution. According to his theory, the universe is evolving toward a complex state of consciousness and unity, which he termed the megapoint. Noogenesis refers to an evolutionary process through which consciousness emerges and evolves. Teilhard de Chardin argued that consciousness, particularly human consciousness, is not merely an accidental outcome, but an integral part of the universe's evolution. He proposed that as life evolved, consciousness emerged, leading to the development of the noosphere. The noosphere refers to a sphere or realm of human thought and collective consciousness, encompassing the entirety of human intellectual activity, knowledge, and interconnectedness. Teilhard de Chardin envisioned the noosphere as a stage in the evolution of Earth where human consciousness and communication become increasingly interconnected and influential. According to Teilhard de Chardin's philosophical and theological perspective, the noosphere, representing the collective human consciousness, would continue to evolve and eventually converge into a higher level of unity and spiritual fulfillment known as Christogenesis. This concept suggests that the evolutionary process leads to a transcendent stage of unity and spiritual realization which you can tell from the name he associated with the teachings of Christ. Dark Matter Killed the Dinosaurs Lisa Randall, Michael Rampino, and Michael Reese, among other scientists, have explored ideas linking dark matter to a mass extinction events in Earth's history, including the extinction of the dinosaurs. Dark matter, a mysterious invisible substance that doesn't emit or interact with electromagnetic radiation, makes a significant portion of the universe's mass. However, it's only been observed indirectly through its gravitational effects on visible matter. The proposed hypothesis suggests various ways which dark matter might have affected Earth, potentially leading to mass extinctions. One hypothesis proposes as the solar system orbits the galaxy, it might periodically pass through regions of space containing dense clumps or concentrations of dark matter. These encounters could potentially disturb the orbits of comets or asteroids in the Oort cloud, leading to increased impacts on Earth and triggering mass extinction events. Other speculative ideas suggest that Earth's orbit might intersect with specific regions or planes of dark matter, causing gravitational disturbances that could disrupt the stability of the solar system or lead to increased cosmic impacts. Alien Space Viruses Cause Evolution Hoyle Sir Fred Hoyle, a prominent astronomer and cosmologist, proposed some unorthodox ideas about the role of extraterrestrial viruses in the evolution of life on Earth. Hoyle, along with Chandra Wickramasinghe, were the ones that developed the hypothesis called panspermia, which again suggests that life exists throughout the universe and is distributed by comets, meteorites, or interstellar dust carrying microorganisms, including viruses. Their life cloud theory speculated that these cosmic agents, such as viruses or other microscopic life forms, continually rain down on Earth from space. They proposed that these extraterrestrial viral particles, arriving from cosmic deliveries, could have influenced the course of evolution and played a significant role in the development of life on our planet. Hoya and Wicker Messingi suggested that these spaceborne viruses could have triggered rapid mutations in organisms upon arrival, potentially leading to evolutionary changes and even mass extinctions. They proposed that viral infections from space might have caused the transformation of certain ancient life forms, such as dinosaurs or pterosaurs, into different species including mammals and birds, particularly during significant extinction events like the end Cretaceous extinction that marked the end of the dinosaurs. The Namelosphere The concept of the Namelosphere was proposed by Randolph Kirkpatrick, a sponge geologist in 1912. Kirkpatrick's theory suggests that the Earth's crust was formed from the accumulated remains of millions of years' worth of foraminifera shells, specifically a type of large, dish-shaped foraminifera known as nummulites. Foraminifera are a diverse group of single-celled organisms, often with shells made of calcium carbonate, that are abundant in marine environments. Nummulites are a specific genus of large, lens-shaped foraminifera that live during the Paleogene and Eogene epochs and are known for their distinctive, coin-like appearance. Kirkpatrick proposed that the vast accumulation of pneumolites over immense periods of time formed layers of sedimentary rock, contributing to the structure of the Earth's crust. He envisioned that these ancient foraminifera, through their continuous deposition and accumulation, played a fundamental role in the formation of geological strata and the shaping of the planet's surface. So that concludes the end of the video. I hope you all enjoyed. Remember to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you in Tier 5. Bye.